All right, good afternoon, and thank you for joining our briefing on the City of Philadelphia's response to gun violence. This, bri this briefing is for press only. If you are not a member of the press, please log out and watch today's live stream on the City of Philadelphia's Facebook page, or tune in to 900 AM or 96.1 FM WURD. We will begin our briefing with remarks by Mayor Jim Kenney. Mayor, you have the floor. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. As we enter February, we can now take a look back at the first month of the year. And as you see, as you will see in, a, in an update later today from the police department, there are signs of progress. However, we are still facing daunting challenges in confronting the issue of violent crime, especially shootings and homicides concentrated in neighborhoods in our city. As we continue to do everything we can to address this issue and keep our community safe, there are several updates I wanna to highlight today. First, as you may have seen earlier this week in partnership with Councilman Johnson, we announced the head of the newly created Office of Victim Advocate, Adara, Adara Combs, who will start this month. With Adara's deep knowledge of the impact of crime on victims and their loved ones, the complexities of the criminal justice system and our community ties as a native Philadelphia, and I'm confident that she is the right person to lead this important new office. The creation of the Office of Victim Advocate and Adara's confirmation are a step towards guaranteeing that victims of crime in Philadelphia have the support they need to regain a sense of normalcy. Thank you again to Adara for taking on this meaningful work. Thank you to Councilman Johnson for spearheading the creation of this office. And we appreciate City Council's partnership in quickly confirming her to this role. Second, last Thursday in partnership with Council Member Jones, the city released a report that evaluated the circumstances behind more than 2000 shootings over the past year plus. <clears throat> As our administration continues to work relentlessly to reduce violence and create safer communities, this latest report highlights the stark challenges we're up against. This report also underscores the ongoing collaboration we have across our partner agencies with participation and commitments from multiple city departments, city council, the Philadelphia Police Department, the district attorney's office, the first judicial district, the Defender Association, and more. Many of the recommendations offered in the report are strategies currently being implemented by our agencies and by law enforcement. Some of these programs and initiatives include a regular collaborative review of firearm possession cases, investments and interventions focused on those most at risk of perpetuating or being a victim of gun violence, and making sure we are evaluating all our efforts for the effectiveness and the impact they have on communities most impacted by gun violence. Moving forward in partnership with the city council and our public safety agencies, we must continue to invest in the strategies, supports, and resources outlined in the city's roadmap to safer communities, our approach to tackling gun violence in Philadelphia. But a final note before turning things over, as we enter and begin to celebrate Black History this month, Black History Month this month, I'm especially cognizant that so much of the shootings and violence affecting our city are disproportionately tearing apart our communities of color. As we continue to address this issue from every possible angle, our Office of Black Male Engagement is excited to host the city's third annual Black Generational Wealth Series for the bi-monthly for the bi-monthly My Brothers Keeper Action Academy, a national program established by President Obama to dismantle systems of inequality and close opportunity gaps for boys and young men of color. This series features weekly financial empowerment events held throughout February 2022 to empower Black men and their allies with the tools and resources necessary to obtain and maintain generational wealth. The series will hold four different workshops, all free, covering topics like financial literacy, assessing city resources, services, and initiatives, entrepreneurship, and transferring wealth. These seminars will feature local business leaders, financial experts, and city officials with a wealth of experience and insight. While the Black Generational Wealth Series is targeted to support Black men, all residents are welcome to attend the reg attend by, registra by registration at www.phila.gov. Thanks to the entire team at the Office of Public Engagement for creating, creating spaces for these conversations. The positive impacts of this series will be felt both in the long and short term ahead. Now, so now I'll turn it over to Erica Atwood, Senior Director, Office of Policy and Strategic Initiatives for Criminal Justice and Public Safety for additional updates. Erica. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kenny, and good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to take a, a 
my time to second the mayor's feelings on the appointment of uh, Derek Holmes as a victim advocate. I also want to express my commitment to this new office and to the goal of coordinating and providing services for victims and co-victims so they can return to living their lives fully. So often when we work, when working in criminal justice and public safety, we find ourselves focused on the perpetrators of crime and on the harms caused. It is less common that we have an opportunity to center uh, the the city's victims and their healing. Uh, with the establishment of uh, the Office of the Victim Advocate, I am excited to expand the city's human-centered approach to those harmed by crime in our city and to build a pipeline that's, that starts at the crime but ends with healing and a path to trauma resolution. Adara L. Combs built her career uh, on the intimate knowledge of the criminal justice system, amplifying the voices of those often un uh, unheard, and a commitment to dignity and respect for everyone she works with, no matter what side of the courtroom they sit on. Uh, as the pre-adjudicary juvenile diversion coordinator, Adara coordinated youth diversion programs and led them with her vision and commitment to Philadelphians. After receiving her JD from Beasley School of Law at Temple University, uh, Adara went on to serve as a prosecutor in a courtroom where she realized her passion for victim advocacy. She eventually rose to be supervisor for the juvenile division uh, in the district attorney's office before now um, joining us to be our first victim advocate. I want to be clear. Um, the diversity of traumas experienced by victims and co-victims demand a diverse and coordinated set of supports and resources. I believe Adair, with her long career in, criminal in the criminal justice system and her commitment to Philadelphians, is the right person to provide this long overdue coordination and advocacy. More than just a, her credentials, she's a Philadelphian born and raised, and I am confident that her appointment and the creation of this office, um, because she's committed to the city and its people. She understands the needs that we have and has the ha her hand on the pulse of the city. We look forward to her uh, building a partnership with Adair in the coming weeks that she establishes herself in this role. And she will be uh, in the office bright and early Monday morning, um, February 7th. I'm optimistic that together we can build pathways, not only leading to justice, but healing for all Philadelphians. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Commissioner Alcock. Thank you, Commissioner Alcock. Um, Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Erica. Before beginning our presentation, I wanted to discuss the officer-involved shooting that took place a couple of days ago at 27th and Brown Streets. On Monday, January 31st, ninth district officers received multiple calls for a person with a gun outside of a business, business at 27th and Brown Streets. And when officers arrived on location, they encountered a male armed with a gun. The officers ordered the male to drop the gun several times. What we now know is that the male did not drop his weapon and further pointed that weapon in the direction of our officers. Our officers then opened fire, wounding the male. The male was then transported to Presbyterian Hospital by medics, and he is expected to survive. Thankfully, there were no civilians or officers hurt. And as you can imagine, this was a harrowing ordeal for the officers who responded as well as the civilians who were out on location at the time that this incident took place. I want again to assure our public that our officer involved shooting investigations unit will be conducting a full review of what occurred on the scene. And while this review is taking place, these officers have been placed on administrative duty pending the outcome of a full internal affairs investigation. These incidents continue to highlight the dangers that our officers and civilians face. There are far too many individuals who believe that they can commit crimes in our city without impunity, and enough is enough, quite frankly. On our end, the Philadelphia Police Department continues to work hard to make sure that these individuals are held accountable. As you know, the PPD works closely with other local, state, and federal agencies in combating violent crime within our city. Moreover, we know that one of the biggest drivers of violent crime in the city is the drug trade. Last week, the PPD, in, conjunct in conjunction with the DEA, or the Drug Enforcement Agency um, here in Philadelphia, seized multiple firearms and narcotics in a joint operation. This operation netted over $2 million in seized narcotics and took 14 firearms off of the street. Firearms that could have landed in the wrong hands. 
As Deputy Commissioner Ben Nash, Deputy Commissioner of Investigations, will highlight during his presentation, our efforts do not stop there. The PPD continues to track dangerous criminals, gather intelligence, and bring stronger and more solid cases for successful prosecution. It is through these ongoing efforts that we will see a decrease in violent crime in our city. Moving on, since holding our last press conference, I can say that we're beginning to see our homicide and our shooting numbers trend in the right direction. Over this time last year, as of last night, our homicide numbers are down 12% and our shooting numbers are down 2%. While we remain cautiously optimistic that we will continue to see these numbers go down in the weeks and months to come, we will continue to keep a very close eye on these data points and ensure that we're deploying the appropriate resources in the areas where they are needed. Deputy Commissioner Nails, who's our Deputy Commissioner over Patrol Operations, will elaborate on this further during his presentation. Listen, we know that the number of homicide and shooting victims is still up from our previous years, and we are working tirelessly to apprehend the individuals responsible and to stop them from committing these crimes in the first place. Again, those affected by crime aren't just statistics to us. These are individuals, they're human beings, they're family members whose loss affects many, many people around them. These are individuals whose lives that are changed forever, who experience hardships and who struggle, to return to a sense of normalcy long after they were touched by crime. Before I turn this over to Deputy Commissioner Dales, I wanted to take a moment, uh, as the mayor did, to acknowledge Black History Month. This month celebrates the many accomplishments of Black Americans and our contributions to the cultural tapestry of the United States. Our country has come a long way from the nation's birth until today, but we still have a lot of work left to do. Black History Month is about celebrating our contributions, but also about finding our voices, using those voices for good and fighting for freedom, equality, and justice. I encourage everyone to reflect on how Black Americans have added to our nation's history and commit to embracing each and everyone's unique perspectives and embed these perspectives into forging a deeper understanding of each other while bringing stronger communities. To see what the Philadelphia Police Department is doing during Black History Month, please visit our Facebook and Twitter pages and make sure to follow your district's Twitter for PPD Black History Month events. Lastly, I am pleased to announce that this Friday, February 4th, the Police Department will graduate a class of 22 new police communications dispatchers. With the graduation of this class, we will have added 50, 50, 50, new police communications dispatchers in the past two months and expect that the significant influx of new PCDs will help alleviate some of the issues that we've been experiencing with wait, uh, wait times around 911. I want to thank these dispatchers that have answered the call to help their city in its greatest time of need. We are thankful to have them and we wish them long and successful careers. Now to talk about what's happening in our pinpoint grids is Deputy Commissioner Joe Dales, and then he'll be followed up by Deputy Commissioner Ben Nash, Deputy Commissioner of Investigations, who will give updates on recent cases that we wish to highlight. DC Dales. Thank you, Commissioner. And pull up the slides. Next slide. Okay, I will start with the citywide homicide and shooting victim stats. Looking at the top of the chart, year to date, as of January 30th of this year, uh, Philadelphia had 43 homicides and 182 shooting victims. In comparison to last year, homicides are down 10%, 43 this year versus 48 last year, and shooting victims are down 4%, 182 this year versus 189 last year. However, in 2020, the city had six less homicides, which was 37, and 74 less shooting victims, which is 108, when compared to 2020 to 2022, the year in totals. I also want to point out the significant difference in the number of shootings that occurred inside of a building. In 2022, we had 14. In 2021, we had three. And in 2019, I'm sorry, and in 2020, we had six. Looking at the bottom left of the chart, it shows the motives for the homicides. The top three motives are arguments. Number two, domestics, which is currently down by 50%. And number three, drugs. Next slide, please. This slide shows the citywide homicide and shooting victim stats two-week comparison. 
from January 17th to January 30th, we had 16 homicides, 70 shooting, vic shooting victims, which include homicides and multiple shooting victims, and 59 shooting occurrences. When comparing the current two-week period from January 17th to January 30th with the previous two-week period um, from January 3rd to January 16th, it shows homicides down 36%, shooting victims down 22%, and shooting occurrences down 23%. Next slide, please. This slide shows the comparison between citywide homicides and homicides that occurred in the 10-point grids. If you look at the top of the chart, it shows citywide homicides down 10%. And looking at the bottom chart, it shows homicides in the pinpoint grids up 13%, 18 this year versus 16 last year, year to date. Next slide, please. This slide shows the comparison between citywide shooting victims and shooting victims in the pinpoint grids. Citywide shooting victims are down 4% and the pinpoint grids are even at 0%, 72 this year and 72 last year, so it remained the same. Next slide. This slide shows the year in total VUF arrests for 2018 through 2021 and the total VUF arrest year to date for 2022 from January 1st to January 30th. In 2021, we reached an all-time high for VUF arrest that totaled 2,541. And so far this year, we have made 185 VUF arrests. <clears throat> this time last year, we had 320 VUF arrests and 128 VUF arrests in 2020, which shows an increase in VUF arrests by 45% when comparing 2022 year-to-date total with 2020 and a decrease in VUF arrests by 42% when comparing 2022 year-to-date with 2021. Next slide, please. In 2021, we recovered 509 crime guns by the end of January. If you look at the bottom of the bar in 2021, you see 509 highlighted in orange. That's the total amount of crime guns recovered in January for that year. So as of January 31st of this year, we recovered 494 crime guns in our city. If we continue at this rate, we will reach a total of, a total of 5,819 by the end of the year, which is a little less than the total crime guns recovered in 2021, which was again, 5,907. However, when comparing the total crime guns recovered in January, 2022, which again is 494 with January 2020, which was 417, again, is highlighted in orange at the bottom of the bar, and January 2019, which was 364, it shows that we have currently surpassed these numbers in 2022. Next slide, please. And lastly, in reference to the privately made firearms, also known as ghost guns, that were recovered in our city year to date, as of January 31st, we are now at 40. And with that, I will now turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Ben Nash, who is the Deputy Commissioner of Investigations, and he will speak about cases we wish to highlight. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Dales. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to be starting my presentation off a little bit differently than I typically have. I've been um, generally focusing just on the homicides in the last number of press conferences, um, talking about the great work that our homicide unit has been doing and um, working on a lot of these cases. But as the commissioner mentioned in her opening remarks today, um, we are going to put a little bit of, of um, notice and emphasis on our Narcotics Bureau. They've been doing some tremendous work. And today I want to have an opportunity to talk about some of their success recently. Um, after that, I will be providing the updates on the homicide investigations as I, as I normally do. Since uh, the last press conference, we've arrested 10 individuals, one in four homicides. And in addition, I'm going to be featuring the fut some, a number of fugitives that are currently wanted for homicides. Um, I'm also going to be providing some information about a shooting that occurred just last night and is being investigated by our new shooting investigations group. Um, I have uh, some, some uh, images that were obtained through surveillance video, and we're looking for some help from the public. And then I'm gonna talk about carjackings. Um, we know that this has been a, an ongoing problem and we've been talking about that recently, and it's been something that the entire country, our nation has been faced with. 
So um, please go on to the next slide and specifically um, in talking about narcotics bureau seizures. In the month of January, just January, the Narcotics Bureau made over 200 arrests. We've seized over 54 firearms and we've also seized over $450,000 United States currency. Um, in addition to the guns and money that's been seized in these drug investigations, we've also seized seven and a half million dollars worth of illegal narcotics. And let me be clear, this is not anything close to all the work they've been doing. This, this is just a small fraction, but it is a visual of what we've been um, acquiring, what we've been taking off of the streets. And a lot of this drug activity does drive the violence. Um, while these slides only represent a fraction of the seizures, uh, again, it's important to note that our Narcotics Bureau has been working incredibly hard, and I, I would hope that their work doesn't go unnoticed, and it deserves some uh, real recognition. Uh, their dedication to taking illegal drugs off the street and arresting offenders is greatly appreciated. Now on to our homicide updates. The following slides are going to be of individuals recently arrested for homicide. I'm going to, again, as I've been doing, listing the incidents chronologically by date of occurrence from the earliest to the most recent, starting with an incident that occurred in 2020. When, and the arrest occurred on January 19th of this year. 22-year-old Gene Seibert on the left was charged with the murder of 40-year-old Morton Murray. Gene Seibert was already in custody on the charge of aggravated assault for shooting the victim back on November the 22nd of 2020. That's when the incident occurred, November 22nd of 2020. The incident occurred on the 600 block of North 55th Street. Morton Murray died this past year, almost exactly one year after the original incident on November the 23rd of 2021. And that was ruled due to the injuries he sustained during the shooting. Now, in addition to the arrest of Mr. Seibert for the homicide on January 24th, 25th, just six days later, we also arrested 23-year-old Tiana Morgan, who's on the right, and she was arrested for her involvement in the murder of Morton Murray. The next slide is a slide of Mr. Jacob McMahon. Now, Jacob, on January the 21st, Jacob McMahon was arrested for the brutal murder of 83-year-old Mauricio Gizmundo. The incident occurred on January 1st of 2021. This was one of the first homicides of last year, 2021. And I, if it, if it looks familiar or if it sounds familiar, I did speak about this particular case during a press conference back in September where police officers in Pinellas, Florida apprehended Mr. McMahon. And I am able to say now that he's been officially extradited to Philadelphia and charged with the murder conspiracy and robbery and other related offenses as a result of that incident from January 1st of 2021. Next on the screen is a image of Walter Lowry Hicks. And on January the 26th, 29 year old Walter Lowry Hicks was arrested for the murder of 28 year old Jose Lopez for an incident that occurred on April the 13th of 2021. It happened on the 5200 block of Burton Street. The, this incident stemmed from a prior confrontation between the victim and the offenders who were neighbors Mr. Lowry Hicks was featured previously on, this, on a press conference as a wanted person, and his capture would not have been possible if not for the dedicated work of the United States Marshals Fugitive Task Force, who assisted greatly in locating and apprehending this dangerous individual, and we are really grateful for their wonderful partnership. Next slide is a, should be a picture, next. Okay, there it is. Next slide is of Carlos Barry. On January 19th, 25-year-old Carlos Barry was arrested for the murder of 88-year-old Ellen McClellan, an incident that occurred on September 17th, 2021, on the 5100 block of Spruce Street. Carlos Barry was responsible for multiple arsons that occurred on the 5100 block of Spruce Street that day, and he has been charged with that homicide. Next is a photo of Tyrone Leach. On January 24th, 22-year-old Tyrone Leach was arrested for the murder of 19-year-old Alashe Reeder for an incident that occurred on January the 10th of this year on the 1500 block of Pratt Street. Ms. Reeder appears to have been an acquaintance of the offender. She was standing near the intended target when Tyrone Leach pulled out a gun discharged in their direction. 
and it appears unintentionally, but killing and striking uh, Alisha Reader. Next slide is a, there it is, a picture, an arrest photo of Kalechi Chibundu. And this, and on January the 25th, 25 year old Kalechi Chibundu was arrested for the murder of 22 year old Melvin Holloman, an incident that occurred on January the 11th on the 3700 block of North 20th Street. The motive for this incident appears to have been an argument. And during the execution of a search warrant on Mr. Chibundu's residence, we also recovered five firearms. And of those five firearms, two of the firearms were ghost guns or privately made uh, firearms. And that's what Deputy Dales often talks about in his presentation, along with one assault rifle. Now the slide that's up on the screen right now is Jeffrey Stipen. And this case from uh, just a couple of weeks ago received a lot of attention. On January 19th, 48 year old Jeffrey Stepien was arrested for the brutal murder of 31 year old Samantha Mock that occurred minutes earlier on the same day on the 3000 block, on the, I'm sorry, on the 300 block of Chestnut Street. Stepien beat Miss Mock to death with two metal pipes and he was apprehended by police as he was attempting to leave the building. Next slide has photos of Deborah Gilliam and Nicole Redfield. And on January 28th, 41 year old Deborah Gilliam and 44 year old Nicole Redfield arrested for the murder of 57 year old Donald Dale. It occurred on the same date on the 3800 block of Poplar Street. The two offenders were staying with the victim and his wife and they got into a dispute over a high electric bill. Deborah Gilliam allegedly shot the victim multiple times. Um, and was in the company of Ms. Redfield. Um, the arrest was made at the scene. Next, I'm gonna be talking about three individuals wanted for homicides that occurred late last year. The first slide is Nishar Scott. 39-year-old Nishar Scott is one for the murder of 42-year-old Raymond Lightley for an incident that occurred on November the 1st of 2021 on the 900 block of South 4th Street. This arrest warrant was just obtained recently on January the 26th, and the motive for this homicide is believed to have been retaliation. And the next slide is a photo of two people, Jermaine Blair and Yassine Majors. 23-year-old Jermaine Blair and 23-year-old and 23-year-old Yassine Majors. They're both wanted for the murder of 28-year-old Tamir Brown for an incident that occurred on December 28th, 2021 on the 2600 block of Germantown Avenue. This arrest warrant was obtained on January 25th. And let me be clear, this is an indication of how we continue to work the cases from previous months and previous years. Both of these incidents are from, um, uh, both of these wanted are from incidents that occurred last year and we'll continue to work on these cases and bring those cases and bring those arrests in hopefully soon. And next I'm gonna talk about um, a one of the shooting investigations from our shooting investigation group. They just went up uh, just this, this past Monday and they're working on an investigation from yesterday. Um, and it happened yesterday at around 344 inside of the Garcia grocery store at 642 West Diamond Street. There were five unknown black males that walked up to the front of the store, fired multiple shots inside of the store. Uh, all five of the shooters got into the white Kia Seltos that you see on the screen. We did have a, a, a tag identified, and from that we were able to identify that that vehicle had been previously stolen days earlier. Um, the, the vehicle traveled eastbound on Diamond Street. Now the next slide has uh, images, if you put the next slide up, it has the images of, um, they're heavily masked, but you can see the pictures of the three suspects, three of the five people that are involved in this homicide. Now, during this incident, two males were shot. The first male was inside of the store and another male was riding his bike just past the store at the time that the shooting began. First male was shot three times in the legs, uh, once in each leg and once in the right ankle. Um, he was also, he was transported to Temple Hospital by a family member. Second male shot in the left foot. Both the males are in stable condition, expected to survive. Um, you, as you can see from these images there, at least the one on the left, and uh, they're wearing it's wearing very distinctive clothing. We hope somebody in the public will give us some information to help us identify these individuals. If you recognize them, please contact 911 immediately or oh, as always call our tip line um, at 
six, eight, six tips. Um, that's eight, four, seven, seven. Um, and finally, I'm going to highlight, we, as we talked about our carjackings, we have made a number of arrests recently. Um, this one was uh, given a lot of attention. It happened uh, late on Monday. Um, Captain Ryan from Northeast Detective spoke about this case yesterday. Um, so it did get a fair amount of coverage. And um, and it was um, we, Highway Patrol. I'm sorry, I, I, I stand corrected. The one I'm talking, the one that happened yesterday is the next one. This first one is from January the 18th. This one happened in the from the 3100 block of Emerald Street. On January 18th at 9.20, Highway Patrol officers observed a vehicle traveling in the area of Margaret and Frankfurt Avenue. And the officers knew that uh, where they were following a vehicle that had been stolen during a carjacking, and they had information from police radio. The carjacking had occurred just 30 minutes prior, and it had happened on the 3100 block of Emerald Street. The officers conducted a vehicle investigation. They stopped the three males that were inside of the vehicle. The carjacking victim was able to positively identify all three males as the individuals who had just robbed him and recovered from one of the suspects was a nine millimeter fully functional firearm loaded with 13 live rounds. Now, I'm not putting out pictures or the photos because as in a lot of our carjacking investigations, if not all of them, um, we believe we recognize that the individuals that we've arrested uh, may be involved in other incidents involving carjackings. So we have to hold back on putting their photos out um, so that we can show them to other complainants from other carjackings that we suspect. But I can tell you that in this case, the three carjackers, their ages were 18, 19, and 27. Um, all three of them were charged with robbery, conspiracy, and related offenses. Um, two of them that, that, committed, that actually committed the carjacking, they were charged with the carjacking and uh, the possession of a gun violation of the Uniform Firearms Act. Now, this next one, is and you can see from Google Maps, this is the path of when the police got involved, um, or at least from the um, from part of it. It shows where uh, there was an, a second incident up in, on Crescentville Road. Um, and this is the one I was talking about that happened yesterday. And it was officers from our East Division Task Force. They observed a vehicle uh, in the area of Germantown and Cecil B. Moore Avenue. It fit flash information of a uh, Kia that had been taken from a robbery in New Jersey, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The officers attempted to stop the vehicle. It fled and our helicopter, police helicopter, got involved with the pursuit. Uh, the driver of the suspected stolen vehicle, he crashed at a red light in the 6300 block of Crescentville. And that's where you can see the, the at the top left portion of the map is, is indicative of where that initial crash happened. He crashed into a car. It was a vehicle that was stopped. It was an Alexis. And we have video of that offender literally opening the door and pulling the woman out of that Lexus, throwing her out of the car. He jumped into the vehicle. He drove off. Our police helicopter was able to follow the vehicle from the air, providing updates to our officers on the ground. Other officers from the 26 were in the area of 300 Godfrey. Um, and that's part of the blue line that goes down and then goes back up. Uh, they entered a lot. They observed the Lexus, the, and that's the second dot um, kind of in the middle. The officers uh, observed the vehicle. They tried to stop that, that vehicle from, from continuing, but the vehicle intentionally rammed into our police officers. It struck the, uh, the marked police, uh, the police vehicle. The vehicle um, continued on, and we were lucky that our officers did not suffer any life-threatening injuries. Um, the offender continued and drove away. He was able to get away from there. But shortly after that, uh, other officers observed the offender strike another unoc unoccupied vehicle at Tabor and Sanger Streets. Um, he exited the vehicle, and that's the bottom right-hand portion of the screen. Um, he ran from the scene. Officers were directed to that area. Officers were, were in that area. They chased him on foot, and he was arrested. He's been identified as 30-year-old Samuel Ferreira. Um, and... And that is a case that, that is the one that the uh, the captain from Northeast spoke about. Um, I just also want to add that we have also arrested seven other individuals who are committing carjackings in this past week. Um, sorry, somebody has their... Thank you so much. Um, okay. We have arrested seven other individuals for committing carjackings. Three of the suspects were driving vehicles that were taken during carjackings at the time of their arrest. 
Those suspects age ages range from 14 to 24. Now, we have a lot of additional work to do on those investigations to charge the suspects officially um, with carjacking. A lot of times we recover vehicles that have been taken in a carjacking, but we have to get them identified as being the actual carjackers or obtain other uh, forensic, uh, forensic evidence such as fingerprints or DNA off of the cars in order to get those charges. Um, approved for the DA's office and get them charged into the court system. Um, so we'll be doing that on a lot of other people. And in next week's press conference, I'll have additional updates, especially on the carjackings. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Kevin at the mayor's office. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Nash, and thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, we will now move to Q&A for members of the press. Because of limited time, only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions. So we ask that you coordinate beforehand. Reporters are asked to limit their questions to two or fewer for this first round. Today, given the time and the hard deadline of two o'clock that we have, we are limiting topics to the questions related to the presentations for the first round. And if we have time for a second one, we'll open it up. We do have quite a few, uh, we do have quite a few hands raised already. So um, if we are not able to get to you, uh, please follow us. Uh, please follow up with the press office offline. Armando is also available for Spanish interpretation as needed. If you would like to ask a question, please use the raise your hand function and we will unmute you. So with that, I'm gonna to move to Annie McCormick of Channel 6. Hi, um, my question is for Erica Atwood, if you're still on the call. Um, I know that you've talked about it before and you've given the total number of grant money that was allotted for all the anti-violence um, programs. I have Sorry. 20 and grant funding for community groups and um, the 5.6 million for the Commerce Department to spend on programs like workforce development, um, which is linked to anti-violence. Mm -hmm. um, but for the program so far, I'm trying to get an idea of how much of the money has been dispersed and to how many of the programs. Um, and also a reminder again of, of how many programs that you had initially decided to allot that money to. Just trying to get an idea of, of where we're at now that we're into 2022 with how that money sure. has been dispersed. Sure. So um, with the community expansion grants, there was 13.5 million given directly to 31 organizations across the city that are in and serving neighborhoods that are the most vulnerable to gun violence. Um, with regard to disbursement of those funds, um, I'll have to get back to you on where we are, but I do know that the majority of the organizations have gone through um, their fiscal assessments and gotten the first 20% of their grants. And so how we're doing it is we're going through uh, an intake process, fiscal assessment, they sign their grant agreements, then they get the first 20% and, and they'll get uh, continued increments of their grants um, as we go through the process over this calendar year. And specifically for the 5.6 million in the Commerce Department, I know the Commerce Department has had uh, a lot going on in regards to yeah. staffing, people leaving. Has, has that had an impact on it? And, and has any of that money been, been allotted? Uh, we're going to have to get back to you on that from somebody from Commerce. Um, they're directly handling the disbursements of those funds. But I do know that they have been used to support commercial mm -hmm. corridors that are in impacted communities. And last question on, on the same topic too, is that there, there's been some criticism of it from the controller's office and also from Councilwoman Gautier's office as well, um, specifically the short-term impact of it. So what is the timeline that you're expecting to see and what have you seen so far since since that money has, has come out? Or is it just too sure. soon? Sure, I, I think um, <laughs> there is a research that exists that if you invest in communities, um, you will begin to see see um, a turn of the tide in terms of violence. Um, this was not a, a, an issue that was uh, two months, two years in the making. We had started to see increases in um, violence in, in 2016, and we are working to do triage on that. And part of that triage is in the influx of cash to community-based organizations to be able to keep the lights on, to provide safe havens for young people in communities, as well as be able to to provide trauma supports, um, not only just because of the violence, but the, the 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 how poverty and other systemic issues are impacting these communities. Um, this is not throwing away money. These are making investments where we should have been making investments in. Um, 
communities that are the most vulnerable and have a, a number of issues um, the, over generations. Uh, and so what we what we hope to see um, as we are starting to see some some stabilization of numbers, we are we are hoping that this is a part of the equation that will begin to reduce violence. We can't say just investing in community organizations is going to be the um, the golden ticket. It is a part of the bigger puzzle um, to to strengthen the community connectivity and provide supports to long neglected neighborhoods. Um, I have one more question for police, too. I don't know if I can ask that real quick. We're trying to get the data on how many and how many cases of victims or would-be victims um, have actually fired back, injured um, perpetrators. Um, it doesn't look like there's any data anywhere. It appears that it seems to be happening more, but often what it appears to be, the optics don't match up with the data. And I'm wondering if that's something that you have or you're able to track or have tracked in, in, in the past six months. Any I don't. I don't have the definitive numbers on it. Uh, um, I know that we had two recent carjackings um, where uh, would-be victims fired back, and we had the case, the incident from just yesterday, um, where a uh, woman inside of a shop that was being robbed uh, fired at at uh, one of the offenders, um, and she was also struck. Um, I'll have to get back to you with more definitive information um, on on how many we've had in the last six months, but I don't have that. At, I don't have that at the moment. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Uh, we'll now move to Kristen Johansson of uh, UIW. Hi there. Um, my question is first for um, Deputy Commissioner Nash. Do we know um, with the Amber Alert that went out this past weekend, which I believe it was Sunday? Was is there any updates to that to even like pictures, videos? So the incident I believe you're referring to was the car that was taken in a theft on Saturday um, in the area of 2400 block of North 33rd Street. There was a the four year old and the baby. Yeah, yeah there was a four year old in uh, my understanding is the four year old was in the front seat and the child in the car seat was in the back. The, the four year old was dropped off almost immediately upon the car being taken. And uh, the, the vehicle was then uh, recovered and um, the child was located at, at 926. The incident happened at 706 as um, is the information that I have. So it was about a, almost a two and a half hour incident. Um, the Amber Alert went out at 901. Um, and the answer, the, the answer to your question about do we have any additional information, uh, we don't have anything ready to go out publicly. Uh, we, I mean, we obviously we have the vehicle. We are doing a forensic search of the vehicle. Uh, it has not been processed yet. Uh, we'll be looking for fingerprints uh, and or DNA from our offender. Um, we are also continuing to look for video from the area where the vehicle was taken, where it stopped to drop off the the, the first child and where it was recovered. But right now, I don't have any images to share, um, and we're continuing to work on that investigation. And my second question, this may be for city officials. Um, we've had a recent rash of like smash and grabs up and down wall night. There's a lot of storefronts that are empty. Um, the Walgreens is, is, is leaving as is another Wawa. Have you guys had discussions with uh, the business, the commerce, the chamber of commerce or this, you know, the center city district about just that kind of like the emptiness and is that involved with crime? Like or is crime maybe one of the reasons that they're pointing to? No, the emptiness has to do with the fact that not everybody's back to work because not everybody's vaccinated and people are resisting vaccinations and mask wearing and all the other precautions we've been advocating. Um, the um, uh, we, We're meeting uh, tomorrow, we meet regularly with the, with the business owners um, uh, in Center City predominantly and in other neighborhoods, but in Center City a lot. Um, and um, the more people we get back into office buildings, uh, the more people we'll have on the street, the more people we'll have shopping uh, in in pharmacies and in fast food and in other places. Um, but I don't believe it's an issue of the crime. I think it's an issue of people not being back in full uh, from the pandemic at this point. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, we'll now go to Manny Smith, uh, CBS3. Manny? Thank you so much. Uh, first question is for uh, Deputy Commissioner Nash and maybe the commissioner. You know, earlier this week, the carjacking chase and arrest, the one that, that you know, started with the car that was stolen in New Jersey, uh, just seemed to a lot of us in a newsroom. 
don't really see that many Philly police chases, if you will. Does that represent a more aggressive stance by the department in trying to address and solve these carjackings? And was that the the special unit you guys have to address carjackings involved in that chase? So the main reason that we were able to conduct that um, continued pursuit uh, was because of the assistance that we had from our helicopter, our TAC Air. Um, and the helicopter allows our folks to stay back a little bit further um, without driving at whatever crazy speeds the, the, the offender might be driving um, and, and know where the vehicle is. Um, is it a more aggressive stance? Well, we still have very strict policies on pursuits and that hasn't changed. Um, so those are decisions and determinations that are made on the ground by the supervisors, looking at the speed of the, the suspect vehicle, the conditions, um, the level of traffic. So all those factors come into play. Um, we're not changing our policy as a result of the recent rash of carjackings. We still have to maintain uh, keeping and recognizing that pursuits are inherently dangerous and we don't wanna put members of the public in added danger. Um, but in that one, I can tell you that after the um, first, uh, or I should say that the the, it, the Crescentville the Crescentville Road incident where he smashed into a car in front and then he dragged a woman out, that did raise our level of uh, of concern about not about not wanting to pull back and make sure that we took this dangerous offender off the street. Um, but all in all. Uh, we're, I don't think you're going to see more pursuits. We're using other means in order to identify our offenders. We're using a lot of investigative techniques, um, and we are working closely with our federal partners. We have partnerships with, and I've talked about them before, with the FBI, the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. But we also have our Pennsylvania State Police is, is joining our, our, our collaboration, um, and so is the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office. So we've got literally state, federal, as well as all of our local partners um, who are working with us, we're sharing information and we're all keeping on top of that. This is a national problem across the country. We, I can tell you that overall, we believe that there are a small, relatively small number of individuals that are responsible for a vast number of these carjackings. And that once we start to identify the individuals, take them off of the street and get them behind bars, we will see some significant positive results and the carjackings will go down. And cool. And just one quick follow up. Uh, that so was the carjacking unit involved in that particular incident? No. Okay. All right. Cool. I just wanted to ask. Okay. And then my second question is for the commissioner and and the mayor. Actually, commissioner, I saw you when you were on camera a little bit earlier. Uh, saw you uh, in your nice new office uh, there. And that's my question about the new public services building. We can see as neighbors that you guys have moved in over there. We know that's been a major investment for the city. Can, you know, can you guys give us a status update on you guys moving in? I've, I've noticed a lot more cars on the street over there. And have you guys started to see any early impacts from increased collaboration or anything from being in that space? Um, you know, I can start. We're actually still in the process of moving in. So uh, we're not completely moved in yet. We, we're still um, between the old building and here. Um, so I will say it's like with any move, whether it's a professional or personal move, we're still transitioning and making sure lines are transitioned over all of the resources, technology, computers, chairs, people, table, all that kind of stuff is um, is going. So we're, we're not completely public facing yet, but I will tell you that our operations have not missed a beat. So I wouldn't say there's been an increase in collaborations because we've moved here. We're still doing what we're, you know, what we've done in the past. And just a little bit on the history of how we came to be there. Um, after that building got passed over for a casino license, uh, it seemed unlikely that it might be um, designated for any other use because of the size of the building and its particular stark significance. Uh, and we decided rather than have the police administration building in West Philadelphia, which I didn't understand the connection for that to begin with, because the police have to be so close to the courts. Being in West Philly would create a problem uh, interacting with the court system. So we decided to move it there, which freed up uh, Eighth and Race for a development parcel that the city owns. It freed up uh, 11th and Winter, uh, which is where the sixth police district was. It got us out of a lease in the ninth district, 
um, so we don't have to pay that anymore. Uh, and we're getting used, we're getting uh, the ability to use a building uh, that hope that would not maybe not have gone developed for a while. Um, so I think all in all was per, a, a sound decision. So you'll be saving money, is what you're saying? Or? Well, I mean, once we see once we see what the other parcels go for in the market, I mean, Ethan Race is a pretty marketable location for uh, the high number of residential developments that's going on. Um, so, I mean, we're hoping that we'll make a few dollars out of it and see what see what happens. But the Ethan Race as a functional building for the police was well beyond its its years. I mean, it's it was not a great place to to work in. And when I first became mayor, I remember taking a tour of Ethan Race and going to the homicide unit uh, and was appalled at the conditions that the homicide detectives were working in. Um, and uh, we also have now a state-of-the-art 911 center, uh, it's, which is unbelievably impressive uh, if you get a chance to get a tour of that. Um, so I think all in all, it was the right choice. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left and a couple of more questions. So uh, we'll now move to Chris Palmer at the Inquirer. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a question about the police shooting from the other day that the commissioner referenced earlier. Um, first, was that captured at all on any officer body warrant camera? Um, I can answer that. Uh, the officers that responded to that incident had not have not yet been equipped with the BWC with the body worn camera, um, so we don't have that. But they are going to be receiving their BWCs very shortly. And are you uh, prepared to release the name of the person who was shot? And is that person uh, facing any potential charges in the incident? There are charges that are are pending, um, and I that that information will come out for our public affairs. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll now go to Mike DiMaprio at Axios. Oh, I'm on mute here. Okay, I guess this is for the uh, the commissioner. What do you attribute to, I don't know if you said this earlier, what do you attribute the drop in homicides and shooting victims to uh, so far during the first month of the year compared to last year? Sorry, I was muted. Hey there. Um, you know, I, we were seeing a slow but very steady decline uh, prior to the end of the year. And then we saw a quick uptick, which we had seen, you know, and I know this because we track this and we review it daily and weekly. So I see this as a continuation of our efforts. Um, you know, I, I know some people were thinking that it was because of the weather this past weekend, but these are numbers that include the days prior to that as well. Um, and we just have to stay focused and in our efforts here, stick to our strategy, stick to what we know works. Like I said, 2022, our primary focus is crime and prevention of violent crime or all crime as well, but specifically violent crime. We know that our work with our task forces works. We know that our work with the DA, FBI, ATF works. We know that our work with the, uh, the AG works. So it's constant communication. It's being strategic and intentional about who we identify, making sure that we get the worst of the worst off the street, making key arrests, and then using all the technology and the tools that we have available to us, but also partnering with those in the region because we're recognizing that um, people are coming from outside of the city to commit crimes and then they're going back home or they are... Um, you know, from here and going outside of the city to commit crime. So all of the things that we know work, we're doing um, everything that we can to to bolster that and continue that through in 2022 and hopefully be able to do more. And I think the police getting nearly 6,000 guns off the street last year also contributed to this. All right, that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, and it looks like our last question is from uh, Saj Purple Blackwell Community Radio. So we'll go to her next. Um, thank you very much and great peace and greetings, everyone. Um, so my first question is just kind of a follow up with um, um, Commissioner Nash mentioning the uh, util utilization of the state police and things of that nature. So we're asking now that crime has decreasing is decreased is decreasing again which we do appreciate and see especially in the 18th and 19th district would we consider since we have told the community no in regards to with their cries for a national guard will we then consider utilizing the pa um, state police in a different way and kind of utilize them to assist um, more with the street or beat patrols 
Let me, before, before, before the commissioner jumps in, let me answer this question again for the hundredth time. Yeah. The state, the National Guard is not equipped or trained to do community policing. They're not, they're not licensed to be officers to walk streets, the beats on the street. We use them during the course of the civil unrest to guard property. That's all they did. Our police were free to investigate crimes and make arrests. But the state, the National Guard never made any arrests. They guarded shopping centers. They guarded places of business. That's all they did. And then we were happy that we had them to do that. But having National Guard with rifles patrolling streets in Philadelphia is not a good thing. And I, and again, it doesn't create any situation where they can make arrests. So, I mean, I don't want soldiers marching around our streets. And I'll address the, the second part of that. Uh, we're identifying uh, many avenues, not just the state police, um, to assist us because we recognize this is still a time of crisis. And, um, you know, we need to do what we can to work with our neighboring departments to have more visibility, have more boots on the ground. And so we are considering, and I'll leave it there, we're considering many options. Obviously, when we partner with other agencies, there have to be clear rules of engagement. There has to be, uh, mem you know, MOUs or MOAs, memorandums of understanding or agreements. Uh, so we know who's responsible for what, um, but I think it's very critical that we explore all options now. Uh, when it comes to that, because there are several agencies uh, that have jurisdiction here in the city of Philadelphia and would actually be very beneficial if we can do that, knowing that we have the current staffing concerns and issues that we have today. Thank you very much. And now also, um, there has been an uptick of social media videos with young people with guns in their hands and touting guns. And, um, you know, especially with this, you know, new movement of a certain song that's promoting this kind of talking behavior. Where it does the um, social media task force stand on it? Does it still exist or, or how, it, how are they handling these influx of videos with young kids with guns? So, so there's that's nothing... Got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's nothing new about young people posting videos with guns. We don't have, it's not that there's a task force. We have a unit within our uh, intelligence bureau that continually monitors open source social media platforms. And our investigators look at that. And if there are social media postings that indicate that people who we know or can, can recognize should not be in possession of guns, um, are displaying guns. We follow up on those, um, and we make arrests where they're warranted, where we can get prop, where we can get search warrants and arrest warrants for those individuals. That's there's nothing new about it. It's been going on for a long time, and we have been working very diligently on those platforms to to look for the kinds of things that you're talking about. And we're very much aware of them. And anytime they come to our attention, we we follow up as best as we can. So that's it. now I, I will relate that to. Part of the problem with carjacking, we are we have a, a belief that um, that social media has been glorifying the carjacking, and they've been bragging about carjackings. So we think that some carjackings that are getting social media attention are leading to other carjackings, and that's predominantly where a lot a lot of the juveniles are coming in. Um, we think that they have been making somewhat of a spectacle and a game and keeping score out of something like this. Um, and unfortunately, they're going to find that it has an opportunity to, to an unfortunate opportunity to ruin their life because they're going to they're going to be fa facing harsh consequences when we catch them. And we are going to catch a lot of these individuals that are doing that. So social media has changed our society, but we're watching it very. We're watching all that we can in order to cap to identify people who are doing things they shouldn't be doing. Okay. And can I add to that, just and most importantly, Ms. Purple, whatever information yes. you have or people in the community have information on uh, where we see a possibility of gun violence escalating as a result of the social media postings you're seeing, please report it to the police. We can't do it ourselves. If you see something, let us know. We do have a tip line. You can contact our tip line, 215-686-TIPS. So please share that information with us, okay? Thank you very much. And thank you for the input, especially of, we, state, we talked about this. Uh, police, uh, the state police coming in because we noticed that in the tri-state area, some of the smaller cities have been very effective with utilizing their state police, you know, decreasing crime by 50 and 60 percent. So, you know, now that we understand that the mayor said there's not going to be National Guard, what other tools can we use? That's all. <laughs> Thank you. I love you, Purple. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Sash. Um, so we are, are at time now. So um, for Manny and Mike, you can follow up with the press office offline.
Um, that concludes today's briefing. Thank you all for joining us. We'll convene again in uh, two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks,